Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Commonwealth Cymru Annual Conference. I hope you enjoyed the day yesterday and are looking forward to the three sessions that we've got ahead of us today. Over the last few years, the homelessness and housing support sector has had a huge focus on the impact of trauma and how we can deliver services in a more psychologically informed way. On day two of our annual conference, we're delighted to be joined by ACE Support Hub Director Joe Hopkins, who will provide an overview of the ACE Support Hub's work to promote a compassionate, trauma-informed approach to service delivery, joining the dots between different services and highlighting how individuals, organisations and communities can all play their part. So um, I'd like to introduce Jo uh, to deliver her presentation. Please do engage in the Q&A uh, box to the right of your screen. Jo will be happy to take your questions towards the end of the session. Thanks, Jo. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you for inviting me to, to come along and, and speak to you this morning. Um, as Katie introduced me, I'm Jo Hopkins and I'm the director of the ACE Support Hub. Uh, I've also got a slightly broader role in Public Health Wales, which also looks at criminal justice and violence prevention. But I'm really proud to have been uh, the director of the Support Hub now for just over three years uh, and want to really just spend this morning taking you through some of the stuff that we've already done, some of the stuff that we are doing uh, and hope to, to do more of. And perhaps uh, we can think about as we go along opportunities to link up um, with yourselves if you're doing work in this space, or even if you're just considering what more you might want to be uh, thinking about around uh, trauma uh, and compassionate responses. So what I uh, wanted to start with was really just the kind of thinking about what does a, a trauma-informed nation look like for Wales? Because one of the things I think that we all do really well uh, is think about how we uh, can do our best in the organisations that we work with. Maybe we're in organisations that are in collaborative arrangements with others. There's a real drive, I think, in Wales at the moment to be thinking about how we do co-production uh, but in a really meaningful way you know not the oh we've just worked with these people and, and that's kind of like a gang of us together and that's ticked that box but what does it really mean in order to, to ensure that we've been inclusive in our approaches uh, that we're thinking really hard about things like culture and things like uh, you know the difference that we make to people the impact that can have and how we measure it so all of these things I think are really fundamental to what we might end up calling uh, Wales a trauma-informed nation and I'm really hopeful that uh, in the next three years, in the in the three years we've got whilst uh, this parliament still sits, uh, is that we can get at least much further towards what a, that ambition might be. And that ambition for me is really thinking about everybody in Wales, understanding um, what a trauma-informed approach is and how we achieve it. So that's right from the, the societal level, the person on the street, the person in the community, me, my family, you know, what is we uh, as individuals uh, need to think about and do. And then through the layers of organisations, uh, systems, and then ultimately up to what Wales as a nation needs to consider. So no pressure, everyone. I think um, I think we're on a, a really long journey. It's not just three years. We're not, certainly not going to crack it by then. But I would hope that we're going to be in a position where we can say at least we know with real clarity uh, where we're going and how we're going to evidence uh, that we have made a success of it. So that's the that's the idea. Um, so today I'm going to take you through some of the things I think that that we have done in partnership with others. It's certainly not all about the ACE Hub here, um, but some of the, the kind of activities, uh, the projects, the programmes uh, and the bits of work that we've done uh, with our, our colleagues and partners, just to give you a sense of, of the breadth really of, of where we've been working, but also to, as I said, to, to give that uh, a little bit of impetus around how can we do this better? How can we share the knowledge that we've been gaining and all the great stuff that I know many of you have been doing uh, and bring that together so that we can all uh, work towards this trauma-informed nation and it doesn't just sit with designated kind of areas that may have had a, a bit of Welsh government funding. So on that note, just very quickly for anyone who doesn't know, um, the A Support Hub was set up in 2017 uh, and it is funded by the Welsh Government, uh, particularly from the Children and Families Division, uh, although we have had additional funding over the years from uh, other parts of Welsh Government who've wanted to progress certain things in their policy areas. We're hosted in Public Health Wales. 
Uh, so that's where we provide or provided a home, which obviously for the last two years has been uh, my bedroom. Um, but also uh, we were able then to to kind of tap into some of the the broader conversations around health and well-being uh, and around uh, the ambition for for building a healthier Wales. So it's a real collaboration piece. And, and initially it was set up by Cymru Wealth Wales, which some of you may remember. If you don't, uh, don't worry too much. Um, but it's it's certainly been uh, something that that's kind of been at the forefront, I think, of of some of the, the thinking around what does uh, an ACE inform, so adverse childhood ex experiences uh, informed and then trauma informed Wales look like. But we're not the only show in town. And I think one of the things that I really want to get across at the very beginning of, of this talk is that one of the things we've learned very quickly is that there is certainly more power uh, in, to, in doing things together. Um, and in terms of, of, the sort of trauma informed drive, if you want to call it that, there has been uh, some really big programmes in Wales, some of which are, are still in existence and some of which um, are looking slightly different uh, at the moment. But but what was uh, happening uh, maybe a couple of years ago is that we had three big areas of work that we're looking at uh, really pushing forward with what does um, an ACE informed and trauma informed uh, nation look like in Wales. So here you have uh, a slide that just shows that in a pictorial sense. At the top um, is the Early Action Together programme, which you may remember is the Police and Partners uh, multi-agency programme with uh, a large amount of funding from the Home Office, really looking to, to kind of transform policing and criminal justice, but working with uh, partners in Wales. Uh, so that programme produced a huge amount of research. It also produced a, a lot of training materials, working with Bernardo's, uh, but also a lot of thinking about how we might need to do this differently. And the outcome of that has been really a sense that although we talk a lot about uh, integrated public services and we talk a lot about, you know, we'd really like that 24-7, you know, no wrong door, access to the right service when people need it. Um, actually, there's quite a long way to go. Uh, to achieve that. But there are some real green shoots. There's some, some really exciting stuff that, that's come out of that work um, that now needs to be located both in uh, the, the UK government and the Welsh government, because this working together, the bringing together of the devolved and the non-devolved has highlighted not only the challenges, which many of us uh, live day in, day out, but also those opportunities to, to overcome things by using the Welsh legislation, by thinking differently about how we take forward, um, as we do very well in Wales, you know, the, the kind of partnership endeavours uh, to overcome some of those challenges. So we've really been thinking and looking hard about what the learning is in that area that we can take forward, uh, both by the ACE Hub, but also by any other initiatives that are, that are striving forward in this area. But we all have the same sorts of ambitions in terms of thinking about breaking that cycle of adversity that, that many families are facing. And that includes not only, you know, the sort of learnt behaviours that you might have in, in the household in terms of what might be normalised for some people, but also those structural elements of this. You know, what is the what is the structural uh, inequality that, that communities in Wales face uh, and how do we really kind of uh, overcome some of those huge barriers, those societal barriers, which really underpin uh, a lot of uh, the adversity that, that children will be facing in the household. Um, and then we're thinking also about thinking about violence. And I'll come on to that in a second. Uh, but taking a public health approach to preventing violence and the prevention being the absolute key here. Prevention and early intervention, which was also a, a key work strand of the Early Action Together programme and is also a key work strand of the other criminal justice uh, programmes that we're involved with at the moment in the blueprints. So really thinking about what does it really mean to take a true preventative approach? How brave do we have to be in terms of the funding, the prioritisation? Uh, and how can we in Wales, when we're working in this uh, devolved, non-devolved landscape, ensure that that is a priority? It's quite hard. Um, but I think all these programmes are, are really pushing for that to be uh, the, the continued focus, not the, you know, oh, yes, we understand prevention is important one day and then the next day reverting back immediately into that crisis response um, and reactive, which, you know, which we are unfortunately having to do uh, quite a lot for lots of reasons. But also thinking about that enabling of the, the whole system uh, approach. So this is that point again about it's no good if a couple of us do this. It's no good if a couple of services do this. So I was talking the other day about education with colleagues from further education colleges who we'll, we'll see in a minute uh, are really coming on board with us. Uh, and one of the questions that was asked of me was, well, how does this fit then? H have you worked with the schools that we work with, the feeder schools? Have you worked with you know, Job Centre Plus and, and where young people might go if they no longer want to continue in education? How do we make sure that nobody kind of drops off the points where you know somebody hasn't 
taken a trauma-informed approach or thought about it for their organisation, because that's the experience of real life, isn't it? That's what people uh, go through. Um, and I think, you know, it's almost worse sometimes if you pull the carpet out from under somebody's feet. So they've had a really positive experience that's recognised um, what they uh, may have had in their life um, and really helped to, to support them to overcome that. And then they move on to an area that, that absolutely hasn't got any of that at all. So really thinking about that. So the, the middle cog here um, is the Violence Prevention Unit, which is also funded by the Home Office, but really is working in that space of thinking about uh, prevention and a, a public health approach. So you can see just from these three that we were really keen to show that this is a collaboration and that learning is shared. Um, and I would like to have a slide which has so many more cogs on here that says, and here are the other uh, kind of uh, programmes and projects that we could bring together to, to develop what I think is really a, a community of practice in Wales. Um, that's the ambition, uh, but I'll come on to that a little bit later. So we have been doing quite a lot over the years in, in lots of different spaces and, and the housing and homelessness space and really grateful to uh, come off as well uh, in terms of, of continuing to, to really take forward uh, what the ambition was around that work because this is really, really what I'm talking about in terms of those different areas being connected up uh, in some way. So we've done a lot of work with um, uh, youth services and youth justice, uh, schools in Wales. We've we've really tried over the before the pandemic came along to, to provide face to face training and make sure that offer was available to all schools in Wales. So that's primary and secondary. Um, and the, when the pandemic hit, we, we have tried to, as everyone else did, uh, to, to suddenly upskill ourselves into digital technology uh, and record training. So every school in Wales has access on the hub to, to the training that we provided um, around uh, ACEs and trauma informed approaches. Whether or not they take that up is a, another question. I'm hearing a lot that people are, are still concerned about certain um, areas and whether or not they have uh, taken on board the need to be trauma informed in practice. So. Some of this might be about making sure that everybody knows where to go and where to look for the resources that are already in existence. Uh, and what we're trying to do at the moment is think about uh, education, not just about the schools, uh, but then, as I said, further education and higher education, working with Glyndor, Wrexham Glyndor University um, for their ambition to be the, the first trauma informed uh, university in Wales uh, and we've had some really good um, success with, with the further education system and a couple of our trailblazer colleges, Colleague Cambria and Colleague Gwent, who have really taken on uh, the, the kind of mantle uh, of becoming uh, trauma informed in, in further education. So you can see there that you know that's an example of where we're looking at a, a system within the bigger system, trying to make sure that there isn't any gaps where people might receive something that's really great and then as I say um, move on and find that that support has been removed. We've also been thinking a lot about uh, how we take forward this sectoral approach, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a second, uh, but identifying sectors that are doing fantastic work, but just need something that helps them to pull it all together. So we're thinking about, you know, for example, it's not just about training, it's about thinking about what the organisational culture is uh, and what that culture is within the system. So this year, I'm really pleased to say that Welsh Government has, has enabled us to be thinking much more about that in the substance misuse sector. Um, we have a, a, a bit of funding to bring in somebody called Emma Howells, who was uh, from the sector, to work with us to, to think about that co-production, that, that design of, of what that transformation of the system looks like for substance misuse. So we've got some brilliant training package already developed, but that's just the start of it, really. And actually, it might not be what some of those organisations need. So we really need to think about for the sector, what does that look like? So that's an example of how we've been working. But as you can see, it's sector by sector. Uh, and what we really, really want to get into is that broader community space, that bit where you've got a number of these sectors working together. Um, and what can we share? What can we learn from each other? Because there'll be things that are really applicable to everybody, regardless of which sector you work in, as that kind of universal uh, kind of model. Um, but also those specialist areas that say, well, for us, this was really important, but it might be slightly different for you. So how do we bring that together and then bring in the communities themselves? Because even though we try really hard, don't we, to, to talk about we're working with people with lived experience, we're working with grassroots organisations. I still think there's a lot to do in terms of some of our more marginalised communities. Uh, and how do we now, if we're really serious about moving towards a trauma informed nation, how do we really uh, take that model so it is fully integrated um, and we're able to share the learning that we've got from all the different areas? But one of the things I just wanted to, to kind of land on for a second, as I said, in terms of the education 
bit and this community uh, opportunity is that I think there's a, there's a real um, real sense in Wales that we understand that this is important. Uh, so we're not pushing at a, at a closed door or even a, a slightly uh, stiff one. We are really opening a door to, for people to, to do something that they've hoped and wanted to do for quite some time. And uh, when you scratch the surface and when you have a look at and talk to individuals with, uh, within organisations, we often find there's some real shiny examples, wonderful things that are going on. Um, but if we could just tap into that and have a way of sharing that across uh, all of the work that we do, then I think we, we would be really heartened about um, what progress we're already making and, and what this looks like. So I don't want to give the impression that there's this huge mountain to climb and we've all got all this work to do with all these sectors. The real ethos of what we do is thinking about, well, what have we already got here? What are people already doing? How can we build on that if needed and strengthen it? But actually, how do we celebrate where you, you, you can find individuals um, that are really, really making a difference and then make sure that practice is shared across Wales? So just to give you, I always talk about this um, because it was a real moment for me. A few years ago, I went to visit uh, a primary school in West Wales um, and it's called Clinarios, it's in Ceredigion. And they didn't know who I was. I'd just come for a visit because a friend of mine had said, you really need to go and have a look at this school because they're doing fantastic stuff. So when I went, um, I just left the home office. So that caused a bit of confusion. Everyone uh, was wondering whether I'd be inspecting them for something. So there was a lot of, uh, sort of looking in files and looking a bit nervous. But once we had a conversation and sat down, I said, I'm just here to, because I heard wonderful things about what you do. Uh, could you just talk to me about what that looks like? Um, and it turned out that, you know, that school had been working with the community, but working with parents, with with the wider community that they lived in to overcome some of the challenges that they were facing in a particularly deprived area of, of West Wales. Uh, and really thinking more about, you know, what does that what does that trauma-informed approach look like, but without actually using those words. And that's one of the things I think is really important, that common language and common understanding also needs to understand that people are doing this already. They just might not be describing it in the same way. So the end of the visit, um, I, I said, well, this is fantastic. You know, you've, you've got all this wonderful stuff going on with very little money. I mean, they had a um, I think a sort of static caravan in the in the playground that they used as as the the area for for some support, supporting children that had particular needs a sort of safe space for them to go and and take some time out and things like that. But it was done on a budget of about hundred quid. But anyway, we we kind of got to the end of the the visit and um, I said, well, this is fantastic, you know. Well, what 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 is it that you think is the the key to this? And the head teacher said, Brian Gibbons. He said, um, "Well, I think the key is really that you know we're a school that that's taken in loads of kids that have been excluded from everywhere else. But we haven't had one exclusion in eighteen years." And it, it was just a sentence at the end of the conversation. And I walked away from there thinking, "My goodness, you know these are things that we should know about. These are things that that should be somehow uh, sort of shared with the rest uh, of the world." Um, so that's what I do. So poor poor Linarios is is. Uh, have been talked about in North Macedonia and all sorts of places because it's that sort of uh, example that you know really humble really modest not telling everybody that they're doing it but having that huge huge impact on those children who had been excluded from everywhere else. So in terms of how we're working uh, one of the things that we, we discovered quite early on was that there is a need really to have something that gives people a structure a way of working through what does it mean to be informed about adverse childhood experiences? And what does it mean to be thinking about being trauma informed in practice? So we, we developed, and it has taken some time, a set of resources that, that hopefully will help people to, to move through this process, but really kind of give the power to them. It's not prescribed, you know, it's not like, well, you must be doing this and you must hit this marker by this point. Um, it's really asking people to be reflective in their practice, to be thinking about what they've already done, as I've said, uh, and celebrating those successes, but at the same time, uh, doing that, that assessment of, of where they are, and most importantly, that honesty around what does our culture look and feel like? How does it feel to work in this organisation? Are we trauma informed in terms of our workforce as well as the people that we're here to support? Because I hear a lot as well that, that people um, feel that they are trauma informed because they work with traumatised people. But are you trauma informed in terms of uh, do you understand the pressure on yourself or the uh, the impact on your colleagues of, of doing that day in, day out? And how can we make sure that organisation uh, is informed about that as well, just as, a, as one example? So we have a toolkit called the Trace, Trace Toolkit, and this has been underpinning our work with further education and will underpin our work with substance misuse. 
but we also have a, a, a range of organizations that, that have agreed to work with us to pilot and test it at a, at a more organizational level. Um, so colleagues at Glywood Allen, for example, have been taking this forward uh, and, and really thinking about what does that question uh, actually mean in terms of our culture, the way that we work, our procedures, our policies, do they get in the way? How can we overcome some of those uh, barriers that actually, you know, as a sector or, or perhaps uh, through through government policy and legislation, we've put in our own way um, and really kind of thinking and understanding things like uh, procedures that we might have for discipline, for example, things like that. So it's, it's really trying to get people to really think hard about their own organisations. And as I say, it's quite difficult because, you know, some of this is is having to be really honest about things that aren't working quite so well. Um, but but the idea being that in identifying those areas and identifying what we need to do, we then need to create something that says, well, where, where can we look to find some inspiration uh, for that? So is there someone who has already tried this and, and found a way to, to, to make it work? It will not be a one size fits all. We can't just go, oh, look, we can go over there then and, and potentially buy this thing in and, and that will solve it. Because I think part of the problem, and I, I often talk about consultants called Dave, and apology to any consultants on the call who are called Dave. I'm, I'm not sort of generalizing this, but they pop up, don't they, and say, well, we've identified that there might be a gap in the market and we can sell you this. And some of it might be great. Others of it, we don't know whether or not it makes any difference or not. But the point is, by doing this process, and this is, you know, this is free, this is available on our website, uh, at least we have a sense of what is it we need? Where, where might we uh, look to enhance what we're doing? Where might we be able to celebrate and share with others the, the successful approaches we've taken? And how do we then uh, create this community of practice or, or movement or whatever? And it might be networks. And I know that there are a number of networks that perhaps we could join up um, and really kind of make more powerful in the sense of, of that additional information and learning. But how do we how do we do that? So this is about uh, growing an approach uh, at, a, at an organizational level, at a sector level, as I said, um, testing with higher and further education and, and substance misuse but also then leading to what I'll talk about in a bit later, uh, that national uh, framework for how we operationalize that, that uh, uh, real understanding of, of what a, a trauma-informed approach is. So one of the, the key areas that, that we started with is really saying, and I've, I've spoken briefly about the, that, that kind of common language point, are we all understanding what we mean um, by taking a trauma-informed approach? Um, as you'll see later, we've done a bit of work that basically has identified that, that no, we don't. Um, so one of the things that, that Glyndore University has done uh, from the outset really is to think about that in terms of their approach to becoming a trauma-informed uh, university and, and they really wanted to, to be really clear for their students, their staff, for their community what it is we're talking about. So they've developed a lovely animation. Now this animation was, was put together um, as part of a student's work, so it was a competition to design the actual animation itself. Uh, and then a, a wonderful um, PhD student at, at the university called Tegan Briley Solis uh, put together the, the kind of the, the, the narrative that goes with this. So some of you may have seen it, but I think it's just important to show it again so that you get a sense of this is what we are talking about when we talk about trauma uh, at a, in this more kind of universal space. And this is what we want people to understand by it. If you could play the video, please. We are all navigating life, just like boats navigate water. When our life feels calm and manageable, the water gently laps the side of our boat. When life feels tough, the water is a stormy ocean with terrifying waves crashing all around. Some of us will be scared to face this storm, but manage to brace ourselves to do so, while others will feel anxious and may struggle to cope, fearing that one big wave could destroy them. As the storm passes, we focus on our recovery, but this is not always so simple. The experience of such an event may leave some to question their safety, anticipating another storm which will carry them out to sea again. The boat that we use to navigate the waters in life adjusts as we grow and our circumstances change. We might start life as a luxurious cruise liner, while others would compare themselves to a small sailboat or even a simple plank of wood. Each vessel is unique, based on experiences, relationships and self-identity. To the outside world, a boat can look worn. The boat may have a few leaks or a broken sail, but we may feel happy, content and safe on board. Another boat may look safe and sturdy, 
but there are various issues on board or below deck that can't be seen. The water can also be a treacherous place, and some of us may have found ourselves in predatory waters for some time. Even moving to safer, gentler waters, mistrust can prevail and some of us remain on guard. Our adverse reactions are often rooted in our previous experiences and remain difficult to ignore. After a challenging period, it is helpful to seek safety with a chance to be guided and supported by others and to rest and repair any damage. Without help to dock, we may be deprived of an opportunity to take time to revive our confidence and feel forced to remain in choppy waters, struggling to feel safe and lost without help. Distress flares equip our boats to save us, but they are only useful if we are able to recognise danger, know when to ask for help and know how to use them. They can also be misused with constant threats perceived in every situation and in a constant state of high alert. It is important to use our anchor of resilience, which gives us control when things get tough, helps us to stay on course and learn from our experiences. It is not our fault if we struggle to use our anchors. We have little control over its weight. Our vessels are also equipped with a trauma-informed telescope. This allows us to look through a lens at an individual, their boat and the water surrounding them and begin to understand their own specific situation. Through this, we can connect and respond with kindness in a safe and trustworthy way. A collaborative, trauma-informed approach can teach us to recognise that each separate journey is unique. It is important to understand, however, that regardless of experience and adversity, we all have strengths and can go on to successfully navigate the storms that may come our way. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I think you'll see from there that there is a, a real kind of sense, isn't there, of, of, of getting a common understanding about what it is that we are uh, trying to get across, but but for, for young people, this is developed by young people, um, but also for, for, for individuals, for organisations, for systems. So that's available for anyone to use uh, in terms of, of perhaps you know setting the scene or, or working uh, with people just to get that common understanding. So it's a resource available to, to, to anyone. So one of the things that, that we were thinking about uh, and working with Wrexham Blindore University to really try and develop in North Wales is this sense of what does it mean to move from that sectoral approach and, and into much more of that community space. So thinking about what our communities are, how do we define that? You know, some for some people that might be just the area in which they live, the village in which they live, the town in which they live. For others, it's a real uh, kind of bringing together of public, private services, society, third sector, communities themselves and individuals. Uh, so we really need to think about how people understand that concept of, of community. But one of the things that we're really keen to, to try and uh, move towards uh, is thinking in terms of that longer term ambition of a trace informed Wales, but looking at the, the kind of real uh, tenants behind what it is that we we want to achieve and one of the the key quotes that we've picked up from from the resilience film as it's known in shorthand the the biology of stress and science of hope is that if you put the knowledge of adverse childhood experiences and trauma into the hands of the public and they will create very wise decisions this is not about us imposing uh, a view of the world this is about saying let's work together to think about how we can uh, build on kindness compassion recognizing what's already happening out there uh, and engaging with people in a language that they understand so not not necessarily coming in and introducing jargon and, and things like that but what are you doing and how do you describe it uh, and those assets that are, are, are already there thinking really carefully about what community means uh, how we define it and what people understand by that and, and really thinking as well about that that word resilience which i know is a bit problematic but i think in terms of of in the, in the position we're in where we cannot say 
uh, well, I certainly can't, that we are going to be able to prevent these things from happening in every case, in particular when we come on in a minute to talk about uh, trauma as a result of conflict. We certainly can't at the moment. So what is it that we can do to, to help people to, to overcome what they have already experienced? And then thinking about that at, at scale uh, in terms of a, a national response. But we've got to start somewhere. So one of the things I think you might be familiar with, but it's worth showing again, is our Time to Be Kind campaign. So we've done this twice once uh you know a couple of years ago where we really just wanted to get this message about everyone can do something in this space if it's just a, a you know a moment of kindness a moment where you can be that person that, that changes someone's day for the better um that is really important and and you know having that that com kindness compassion empathetic approach where we can uh is something that we can all do um and it's really part of that trauma aware level of of thinking in terms of this universal approach so during the pandemic, of course, we we all became uh, uh, distanced from from perhaps the usual connections that we might have. So we slightly changed the campaign to reflect that. Um, it's a little bit bumpy. This one, it, it was done as we all were uh, in behind closed doors. Even putting the the campaign together was was really quite tricky. But the idea is to say that the the power and importance of that continued connection, however that is done, you know, with a digital form, if we can't do it in in person, is so so important. We mustn't forget that you know when we're talking about cultures and structures and systems and organizations underpinning that is the simple human kindness that we that we are all capable um, of of expressing so if we just play this one please thank you Okay, okay guys, guys this, this next, next question, question then on question, question four, four it says we have to compare and contrast question, question three and question two, two to get the answer but then um Sorry about that, guys. Is everything alright, though? There you go. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all fine. Right, we'll finish the rest tomorrow then, okay? See you guys. Tra, tra, later, Gaff. Gethin, just a quick one before you go. How's your dad? I haven't heard from him in a while. Yeah, he's, um, he's not doing the best. Actually, he just lost his job. Oh, Gethin, I'm sorry to hear about that. I'll give him a call later on, just to check in. Remember, if you want to talk about anything, me and James are here, okay? Yeah, Gath, we'll give him a text later, alright? Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I also get a, a, still get quite emotional about that actually because it's it was really trying to get across a lot of messages all in one in one go. One was not to try and uh, place the responsibility for for whatever was going on in the household where the shouting was happening on the other children to sort out. But how do we get across that you know dad in the background there wasn't spying or snooping on their on their school project and listening in? Um, but also giving that sense that you know we are all in our own houses and and we mustn't forget that there are people struggling and and to just make that connection connection essentially so um there was a lot going on in it but I, I do feel that that really kind of represents what we what we stand for uh, actually in terms of that that societal approach it's the, really the ethos of it of, of staying connected you know being kind and, and having that you know noticing uh, that somebody might not uh, be having a, a the best day and how do we how do we do something to, to support that But one of the things when we've been thinking about, you know, what does it mean to be a trauma informed nation is, is getting an understanding of, of A, what does that mean as a phrase? But B, like I said before, what has actually been going on in Wales um, in terms of, of the, the fantastic work that we know is happening in big programmes, big projects, but also in, in much more sort of um, localised, more grassroots uh, organisations that, that probably have been working in this way for a very long time. But as I say, unless you unless you have a conversation and connect with them, you might not know. So before we uh, embarked on the thing I'm going to talk about in a second, one of the key uh, areas that I thought was really important, and so did um, Wrexham Glyndor University as they embarked on their work to become trauma-informed university, was to really get handle on what do we mean by that phrase? So uh, you'll be not very unsurprised, I'm sure, to, to find 
the, the, the work didn't identify uh, a common definition. There's some really good ones out there. Most people use the SAMHSA definition in terms of trauma-informed practice. Um, we've seen that, you know, being uh, used across the UK. But actually, what, what, does it, what does it mean? And what are the other things? Does it include everything that we would like to see? Um, so we did a piece of work uh, with Wrexham Glendore University just to do a, a literature review, effectively, of, of the key language and the terminology that's been used. Um, so as I say, it, it came out with uh, no common uh, definition, but also some really interesting and challenging uh, th descriptions and different ways of, of talking about how we are uh, either trauma aware, informed, sensitive. You know, there's lots of different uh, ways of describing the different levels of practice. So that would be really helpful to, to kind of get a sense of what's there and what's not there in order to shape what we might be thinking about in terms of, of the Welsh uh, kind of position on that. The second piece of work, and these are all available on our website, um, was to look at uh, how this is being taken forward in Wales by, by more significant projects and programmes. So again, this was done uh, during lockdown, so it was quite hard to, to kind of do that sort of uh, quantitative data where you go out and actually speak to people um, but we, we kind of picked up on those uh, pieces of work that are in the public domain where there are things that, that have been quite uh, upfront about being trauma-informed or trying to be uh, so had a look around what are the different practices what are the different approaches being taken in Wales uh, what's the terminology again how is that being used and again we see quite a lot of divergence in that um, which was really helpful to understand what are those different forms of language being used to describe what people think they're doing, but also some commonalities, so some consensus areas in terms of everybody thought that this was a really important concept. So those two pieces together have been really helpful in shaping our understanding not only of, of what the terminology looks like, but also how it's being uh, operationally deployed in Wales. And, and I'm sure many of you who were uh, operating in this space uh, would have taken part in in that second one so th thank you for for doing so because it's been a really really important piece of work and then the third of course has been the animation to try and uh, bring this all to life so one of the things that was really really kind of critical i guess uh, and it became more critical um, towards the end of last year is this understanding about uh, we seem to have taken a bit of a leap. We seem to have gone from, right, we all kind of know what ACEs are now. Uh, so we, we feel that we're informed. But what are we going to do about it? Um, so the so what question. And I felt that we'd taken a bit of a leap to go, OK, so the so what is we're going to be trauma informed. Uh, and that's great. But what does that actually mean? Uh, and if we are going to say that that is our response, then how do we understand that we're doing it in the same way? So the same challenges that, that kind of presented themselves right at the beginning of this journey. And then we also thought about some of the tensions that have been bubbling under, I guess, um, across the UK and probably wider than that around how does this fit with a medical model? How does this fit when, you know, we're talking many of us in a universal space where we're not professionals in health? Um, I'm certainly not. I'm a, I'm a policy person through and through. Um, but, you know, what what is it? Uh, where is that crossover? Where is that bridge where we kind of get to the bit where people might need something much more specialist than, than what we can provide? Uh, may need uh, medical interventions, may need sp specific therapies. How does that fit in a framework or a landscape? Um, where we can really identify what those things are and when people uh, might be able to access and how they might be able to access them. Uh, and so bumping into traumatic stress Wales quite a lot on our journey made us realise that there's more to do in this area. Um, and the Welsh Government Review of ACEs uh, in 2021 also identified that although we seem to be now in a better position in terms of understanding ACEs, we're not so great in terms of uh, thinking about what does that mean in practice. So that's where our focus of effort has been. But really thinking about communities, really thinking about uh, where we need to, 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 to kind of understand more um, to bring that clarity of language and that common purpose. So that's what the trauma uh, practice framework is about, which is currently uh, out for public consultation. Um, I'm going to very quickly take you through the kind of key aspects of that because I'm really keen that people actually go and look at it. Uh, you've got time to respond. It doesn't close until the 17th of June. And we're doing a number of, of workshops that enable people to do that in person or, or via a webinar. But just thinking about you know, this is the definition that's in that framework. This is the definition that we're trying to make as inclusive as broad as possible, which also makes it quite big. Um, but really thinking about, you know, that 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 elements that are really key for us that are not, we don't think, uh, clear enough for Wales. So recognising that everyone has that role, but also where the sort of person, organisation, service or system has to take account of that impact of adversity and trauma and understand those ways of preventing healing and overcoming this, in, including our support services and our communities in which they might be embedded. 
So it's also where people recognise signs and symptoms, and it's also about acknowledging uh, the effects um, that trauma may have and how that's integrated into policies and procedures. So the, the key here is to do no harm and to, to really resist uh, the, the re-traumatisation that can happen uh, as people uh, attempt to access services or to prevent and mitigate the sort of con consequences um, that, that may occur. So that's what our, that's what our definition is trying to do. We've also set out uh, on page eight of the uh, framework document, five practice principles that under, underpin this. So really clear that we are taking that universal approach of doing no harm uh, and bringing in those community approaches, but also making sure we're still person centred. So we're looking at you know, that being the centre of the approach and that co-productive, collaborative, uh, cross-sector uh, piece of work that, that includes that promotion of physical, physical, psychological and physical safety uh, and the other elements that, that you'll be familiar with. Thinking about how inclusive we can be, so really getting into what are the sorts of uh, impacts of things like uh, working with our diverse communities and the discrimination and racism they may have uh, may have experienced. Thinking about those cultural, historic and gender inequalities and being inclusive of, of everyone. And I think that's really important because I personally don't feel that I've done that well enough. Um, and we need to really kind of get a, a better engagement uh, with people who have had those experiences and to be able to understand what they need and how we can how we can use this framework to bring that about thinking again about relationship focus thinking all all the way through about this being strength focused so you know this isn't about uh, blaming anyone or, or deficits or anything like that this is about recognizing where people organizations and systems have strength uh, and building on that so these are the principles that underpin uh, the approach and then we have a model uh, and practice levels that, that we are hoping that, that people will recognise, um, which take us through from that more universal trauma aware uh, kind of uh, bit, which, you know, that's the bit we were talking about with the, the clip of, of the young people talking um, and the Time to Be Kind campaign right through to those real specialist interventions um, that may be needed in a much smaller number of cases. Um, but, you know, are still an important part of, of the overall trauma informed approach. And what's different about this is that we are saying that trauma informed is the is the is the kind of environment in which these practice levels operate. It's not a separate level of its own. Um, so, as I say, really interested in what people uh, think about that. And there's some more detail here about what these practice levels actually mean. So very briefly, as I say, I'm really encouraging people to go and have a look at the document itself. But the trauma aware level is that universal approach. So it's about Welsh society. It's about raising awareness and understanding, challenging those social norms that, that underpin this and maintain that uh, oppression and inequality. Um, but also thinking about communities and the role that, that we all play in terms of the responses to, to adverse child experiences and trauma. Then we have uh, the, the next level, which is thinking about people who are actually working in organisations that have uh, care responsibilities or support people who may have ex experienced trauma. It doesn't matter if we know that they have or not. And this is the important thing for all of this. Um, the trauma aware and trauma skilled elements are, are uh, making an assumption that someone might have, but we don't need to necessarily or may not necessarily know what that is. So that probably applies to most organisations and services, most communities. If we take that approach, then you know, we're not going to do anything wrong, are we, in, in just to, uh, you know, perhaps thinking about this person may have experienced adversity and trauma in their lives. Then we have the level where it's much more an enhanced approach where frontline workers, perhaps who are providing direct support, to people who are known to have experienced traumatic events. So this is about ensuring that we're working with people to help them to, to cope and help them to identify where they might be able to access further support. And then right up to the specialist interventions, which may be those formal um, evidence-based psychological or different interventions. And they're offered in a range of settings, but but you know that would be um, the kind of the, the more specialist end of it. So that's the practice levels. That's what we're advocating in, a, in terms of those, those, those kind of different steps that you might take. But Overall, all of these things are, are trauma informed uh, in approach. I just want to show you a video now um, that just kind of brings us by, back into the here and now, because one of the things, as I said, I'm really keen to do is, is to get a better understanding of the different experiences of our communities. Um, we have worked for many years working on the Harrison Fallop model of trauma informed practice, which talks about you know, choice, empowerment and all of safety, all those things. But what does that mean if you're someone who has been forced to migrate uh, to the UK? If you could play the video now, please.
اینقدر می ترسیدم از همه چی آمدیم در کوها تا زانوی ما پایای می یخ زده بود اصلا نمی ترسیدم را بارو نفس می بالا نمی آمد فکر می کردم همینجا مومورو رحت ودعت رفقاتي اجى وقفنا الجيش السوري قلت لهم عنا شهيد بالشو اسمه لان صغير شايفيني صغير لحسدوني The big guns that I had I've never had before They were looting of people's properties killing, raping, burning of houses All this I witnessed with my eyes. پدر و مادر ندارم. مادرم 6 سال قبل فوت کرده. اندازه یک آدم 25 26 ساله کار میکنه. با خوابم هم همچین چیزا رو فکر نمیکردم که همچین چیزا و همچین اتفاقا پیش میفته. Desde que me vi a mí, dijo que él me llevaba, me llevaba hambre a mí, dijo. Me, a esta chinita le vola del ojo, dijo. Y cuando me quedé adentro, venía él con otro muchacho. Y incluso los dos abusaron de mí. Nosotros nos fuimos a la mía, a la clínica, y 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 a la clínica
Um, so just very quickly uh, on that note, this has been an area of work that we are uh, focusing on at the moment and thinking about what resources are in place for people who are experiencing perhaps adversity in the home, uh, adversity uh, when they have arrived in the UK um, that don't speak English as a first language or Welsh, uh, and how can we make sure that they have support for health and well-being? So where are the sorts of services they can access and what are the sorts of things that they can do uh, to, to kind of help them uh, overcome uh, immediate kind of uh, support needs as well as that longer term? So those are sorts of things that we just want to kind of really kind of take forward, I think, over the next uh, few weeks and months. So that, that concludes uh, my presentation. I hope that's been helpful and gives you a sense of, of what we've been doing. Uh, there's the framework on the end of the last slide. So as I say, encouraging people to, to go along and have a look at that. But, but thanks ever so much for, for the time and, and happy to take any questions, Katie. Thank you so much, Jo. That, um, that was fantastic and covered so many areas during that presentation. So um, yeah, really, really appreciate um, the time and expertise that you've given up today and I think that last video um, and the last topic you were talking about um, ties in really nicely with one of our sessions later on which is titled Nation of Sanctuary Welcoming and Housing Refugees in Wales so a real opportunity to hear about some of the really positive things that have been going on in the housing sector over the past few years um, and a call to action really about what organisations at this conference could do moving forward as, as we see um, you know some of the refugees from the Ukrainian war coming in as well. Um, so, Joe, thank you so much. And yeah, really important. I think it's always been very important to us that we don't just go off and do the trauma informed stuff in isolation, that we, you know, we started out working with the ACE Support Hub on this and want to keep contacts and want to make sure that um, things are really joined up because the reality of the people that our members support is that they don't just interact with one service. They don't just interact with that housing support service. They're interacting with mental health, social services, you know, criminal justice sometimes. Um, and I guess one one of the things that people have struggled with in the past is that you know some sectors and some services have embraced the trauma-informed approach and have tried to embed that and others haven't um so you know what are your kind of reflections on that and and you know what are you as the ACE support hub doing and, and what do you think the welsh government should be doing to try and make sure that maybe some of those services or sectors who haven't necessarily made as much progress actually start to do some of that Thanks, Katie. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. And that that's evidenced by the, the second report I mentioned, actually, which looked at the different approaches across Wales. There's some really, really great examples of, of organisations that have taken this on, have, have looked at all the learning, decided, you know, what, what would be best for them. Um, and we shouldn't you know, we should celebrate that because there's some fantastic work going on. But it it's not across uh, the whole of Wales. Um, it's not across you know, all the sectors, and it's certainly not, I don't think, uh, working necessarily um, at that more community grassroots level in a, co you know, a cohesive way. There are great examples. There's another report we've done that looks at that community level um, approach. And again, great examples of, of people doing fantastic. But but how is that all brought together in that sort of systemic approach? I think um, the, the Welsh Government review last year was helpful in the sense that uh, it had all gone perhaps a little bit quiet in terms of you know people what, where, where are the ace herb what are they doing are they still there you know what 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 is the the kind of longer ambition and is it still a priority for government so it was really helpful to have that set out very clearly that yes it is um but there are some questions that still need to be answered so i think the hub's job now is to really kind of make sure we do answer those questions in terms of what does it mean bring this uh, framework to the national level so that everyone can see where their work fits in to the overall approach. I think that's part of the, the issue is that people can't necessarily see what they're doing in that landscape, uh, but also provide that opportunity, working with yourselves, hopefully, and, and many others to, to create something that, that then says, if you're thinking about doing this, and you need some more information or you need some support. This is where you can go. So like a repository um, so that we can we can really kind of support and enable people to come on this journey with us. I don't think we can mandate it. I'd like to. <laughs> I really like the Welsh Government to go, yes, everybody has to do this. Um, but, you know, in reality, uh, I think it's probably better if we don't, because people need to, to get behind this because they believe in it. Um, so we just need to lead the way, I think, in terms of, of shining a light on the work we're doing really emphasising that link to, to the inequalities. Um, I think Welsh Government could be really uh, useful and proactive in that space. Uh, and one of the things that I think is, is really important is making that link between, you know, this isn't just about what's happened in your home. This is about those structural uh, inequalities that underpin it. So more work to do. But but I really think the next three years gives us that opportunity to to do it together. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, w- one of the slides that, that I found quite useful and interesting was the, the description of the different practice levels. And I think it's really important when we're taking this agenda forward that staff are encouraged to be you know, trauma-informed, psychologically informed in their practice, but also know their professional limitations and know um, when it's best to kind of refer to experts and, and that's really important isn't it that people yes have the confidence to be trauma informed but understand those professional kind of boundaries and limitations isn't it yes i think so and i think we, we often say that you don't need to be a social worker you don't need to be qualified doctor to be trauma informed we can all do it but but needing to understand the point at which we go well, actually there's something a bit more specialist that's needed here and, and that's not me but i can help to navigate the the route towards it Um, Which also goes back then to your question about what what does Welsh Government do, because in order to to be able to access services, they need to be there, they need to be funded, they need to be supported. Uh, And one of the um, comments that's come out of a recent discussion that we've been having on the train work is that it's actually traumatising for somebody to identify their need, to identify uh, an organisation, then be told, you know, no, sorry, that we, we won't be able to help you. And actually, there's no one else that we can signpost you to, because that's that's the, that's the carpet being pulled out again, isn't it? So there is a need to think about investment, I think, in terms of, of where those areas are so that those signposts are meaningful. Um, but, you know, that's a that's a bigger question, I think, than just the framework. Yeah, definitely. Um, and um, you were talking earlier about that kind of need for it not just being reflected in, in service delivery and the relationships that you have with the people receiving the services, but also um, supporting the staff themselves. And something that we've certainly seen in the homeless and housing support sector is that um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Some organisations have the resources, have managed to scram- scramble together the pennies to fund staff to be able to do reflective practice or to get a clinical psychologist in to come and do some more intense work for people working in those much more complex traumatic situations. Um, but I think, you know, from our perspective, um, it's really important that that is, you know, included within the commissioning. Yeah. that it's not down to the size or the capacity of your organisation or your, your ability to fundraise, but it's something that's seen as part and parcel, that staff should get that support. And is, is that something that you would support, a viewpoint absolutely. that you would support? Yeah, absolutely. Commissioning and also recruitment uh, practices, I think, is the other area that, that we've been thinking about. So particularly with the work uh, that we've been doing with the police, there was a report that really highlighted the benefit of, of being really clear um, in terms of what you what you expect and what you want, not just from, from the, the, the services you offer, but those that are, are providing those services for you uh, and in respect of, of, of staff themselves and their welfare, because you see less sickness absence, you see the positive benefits of, of that um, uh, for people who really want to work and, and want to be uh, doing their roles, but are just finding it too difficult to, to manage their own personal uh, spaces but the recruitment aspect I think is really important if you're bringing people into an organization that you want to work in a trauma-informed way then make that explicit in who you're trying to attract to the role because there's no point in you know if you're if you're in a sort of a, an enforcement role and you want to work in that way just recruiting people that can you know bash down doors you really need to think about what other skills do, do people bring and I'd like to see more effort placed on on some of that as well. Fantastic. And I think we've got a real opportunity. We've got a task and finish group looking at workforce in the homelessness and housing support sector at the moment. And um, we've got a, a subgroup to that task and finish group looking specifically, at, you know, support for staff and being psychologically informed. So I think there's real opportunities to kind of set out our stall nationally about what we expect. Um, and, and finally, just before um, we finish the session, I guess we've probably got quite a lot of uh, senior managers and leaders in the audience today. And I guess uh, going back to that point about it not just being service delivery, but it being the whole organisational culture um, from everything from your service provision to how you do your HR to, how, you know, and what would your message be to some of those sort of leaders and managers in the room who are, who are thinking, God, this seems massive. Um, but, you know, what would your message be to them in terms of taking forward this agenda across their whole organisation and culture? I think that that leadership point is is crucial. And we know from the the work that we did with housing and homelessness and the the work that you continue to do with the the path and everything else is that that this is about everybody. Um, So it's top down, bottom up, everybody in between and everybody around. Uh, But without that leadership, without that continued drive um, from the the kind of execs or whoever is, is responsible at the top, then, then it can kind of wither on the vine. Uh, and so what we need is that continued commitment. Um, and I think 
by coming and experiencing some of the the things that that we've been doing so working with us bringing in the voices uh, of of you know let's use further uh, education as an example bringing the learners what what are their experiences what would they like to see different and having those senior people hear that and understand that and engage in those conversations so it's not just about doing the course it's about coming bringing people together perhaps in a way that you haven't done before but really demonstrating uh, that commitment uh, and that's you know, through dispersed leadership as well it's giving people empowering roles to to take this forward i think is is the key to this which you've done very well in housing so there's a, there's a model to look at uh, from the start. Well, we're, we're trying our best, and <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> excuse me, still so much more to do. But I think a sector that's really committed to this agenda and really recognises it, and I think a lot of people working in the sector who have come from, you know, lived experience and, and understand the impact of that as well, and, and want to play their part in you know, making things different for other people in the future. Um, thank you, Joe. That was a fantastic session. It's always really good to hear about what the A Support Hub is doing. And I think sometimes, you know, you can look really, you know, inwardly in your own sector. And I think it's really important that we understand what else is going on um, across Wales, across different sectors, and continue to be part of that conversation and make sure that we're all heading in the right direction. So thank you so much for your, your time and your expertise uh, this morning. Um, to everyone else, we're going to take um, a Bit of a break now um, but we hope to see you back at 12 o'clock where we're going to be hearing from the National Lottery Community Fund um, and several of our members who've been successful in, in gaining um, I think around eight million pounds of funding to deliver new projects to help end homelessness over the next few years and some really really interesting elements of the three projects that we're going to be featuring and an important also um, extra funding that's available for rural homelessness um, and bidding is open now so please do come along and, and hear about that and then as I mentioned mentioned earlier at two o'clock we'll be having our nation of sanctuary session we'll be hearing from housing justice cymru um, taf housing and east about some of the brilliant work they've been doing with refugees and asylum seekers um, and what we can all do uh, moving forward to help with that agenda so i hope you enjoyed that session this morning thanks again to joe and we'll see you all hopefully at 12 o'clock thank you <laughs>